Okay, so uh, hi, uh, my name's Oliver Jewell. Um, this is my second conference. Um, first of all, I must apologise on behalf of myself and my presentation. Technically, I am on holiday, um, and I've just come back from Kruger Park, so I've looked at this very quickly and I've added a couple of things here or there. If there's a spelling mistake or something that doesn't animate right or, or whatever, I'm, I'm saying sorry now for it. <laughs> Secondly, it's my birthday tomorrow, so no nasty questions. But I do see Paul Cowley isn't here, so it might not be a problem, but, but just to also, also mention that too. Okay, so, so when I was here last, uh, I presented a, a, a study on the home range of uh, white sharks in Mossel Bay. It's, it's actually good Dylan went first as well. It's, it's, it's sort of a nice introduction, and some of the things uh, I don't have to go into as much detail on. Um, but after, after many uh, battles with Paul Cowley reviewers and examiners, it's, 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 it's really it's not a true home range of the animal. Um, yes, it's, it's home range analysis, but of course with acoustic tracking you don't get the movement away from the bay, and on rough days it might move somewhere else. So it's not a true home range. Um, what it is, it's a site-specific range of an animal in a bay, analysed with a home range estimate, um, but for short I just call it a home range in this presentation. So. Um, so my background is uh, I studied at the University of Southampton. Uh, I went out to South. I came out to South Africa in 2007 as a marine dynamics volunteer, which is where I worked with Alison Towner. Um, uh, did a bit of work on the cage diving boats. I went back and finished my studies, and then I moved to to Mossel Bay um, to begin my, my research with oceans research with Enrico and Ryan. Um, and that's where we started this work on, um, on, on home range analysis of the shark tracks within Mossel Bay. And that is what I presented when I was here last. Um, in 2009, I was presented with an opportunity to move back to, to marine dynamics and, and the Dyer Island Conservation Trust with Alison, um, with Michelle and with, with Wilfred. Um, it was, at the, at the time, it was a, a very tough decision, but it was the right decision to move for my career. Uh, to build my career up moving there. And I moved my master's research with me. I, I began to look at different things for it. Um, and I graduated last week from University of Pretoria with my master's. And I am one of the 25% that had it in the time. <laughs> with a lot less hair, uh, and maybe, maybe a bit rushed, very rushed towards the end, but I got it in in time. And uh, yeah, so this is the results of it. Um, so. What I really wanted to know when I came to Dyer Island and to Hans Bay is, um, is, is we were starting up a program using acoustic tracks of, of white sharks, manual tracks, which is exactly what we had been doing in Mossel Bay. Um, and there was two studies, on one of them I was still working on, um, and one of them was Ryan Johnson's paper uh, and Enrico's paper in 2009, The Coastal Swimming Patterns. And what I wanted to know was, was if this kind of thing was occurring. Uh, the patrolling in Hartenbos and uh, hunting at Silt Island, uh, very much at dawn and dusk. Um, when I came to Dyer Island and we had big sharks in shore and stuff, I thought for sure they're, they're going to the island at dawn and hunting and they're coming back at uh, the middle of the day and that's when we see them close to the shoreline. And, and one of the things I wanted to, to sort of look at is if that was occurring here. Um, and secondly, um, we did do the home range study, um, home range estimates. Um, <laughs> on the shark tracks in Mossel Bay uh, and we found a few core areas uh, around the river mouths uh, of the island itself uh, and it was it was very much dependent on size with the larger sharks using smaller areas uh, than the smaller sharks so something else that I thought um, we could look at in this area this new area uh, new study um, and see what was different and and already when you look at the area it is very different um, we've got two islands in our system and a lot of kelp and reef and rock and, um, and a lot more seals too, 55 to 60,000 Cape fur seals in this study site as opposed to the five to 6,000 odd um, in Mossel Bay. And, and the narrow channel between the two islands, um, Shark Alley, um, which I'll come back to later. And of course it's a much more exposed area. Um, so the purpose of my study sort of focuses around the island. Um, it's where the seals are, it was the best comparison to what we had in Mossel Bay because a lot of those sharks in Ryan's paper were the ones around uh, Seal Island. Um, and, and, and in particular, you, you can take a bit of note of the white areas. I know Michelle is after me and she will explain those, those white areas a bit more, but those white areas are breaking waves, um, which, which creates its own challenges. 
But what I looked at first when I looked at this area is I realized very quickly, and, and this is sort of following on from, from Dylan's presentation, that those traditional kernel estimates, which are very old, we're just not really going to work around here because you've got so many areas where, where you can't go and, and, and certainly around on the islands themselves, the sharks aren't going to be able to go. And it was quite a, quite a mission to actually get those, uh, even the mossel bay tracks to actually work along the coastline um, because they overspill onto the land. And obviously the land isn't part of a natural, natural range of a shot. So um, it shouldn't really be included. So I started to look at an alternative. Uh, high range with barriers or high range analysis with barriers. Um, and, and if you just look at the, the basic one, you, you, this is the one that we use. This is the traditional um, kernel estimate um, with a smoothing parameter derived by least square cost validation. It's all fairly old, it's been around a long time. Um, and as Dylan said, it does have a bias where it sort of clumps in certain areas. Um, so obviously, these were the high areas of aggregation, but if you look at the movement, there is a lot of stuff moving in between these areas. And for instance, they often use these studies to define protected areas. And if you've got an animal you're protecting, and you say, okay, well, we can stick a gill net there because it's not in, you're still going to end up with, with a lot of those animals not protected because they move through. So the method that I used um, was the movement-based kernel density estimate. Um, there's a paper, Benamu and Cornelius, in 2010, which sort of introduced this method into, into, into science, and it is freely available. Um, you can program it on R, or you can program it on um, Pascal, um, which, is, which is where he sort of designed it. And then you can import it into a program, like I did use Arc10, um, and, and, and you can map your estimates from there into, into an actual map. Uh, but what this does is it sort of incorporates the movement data along the track, and calculates the density based on activity time spent in a location. So it, it results in a, in a sort of smaller smoothing parameter. So for instance, these are two locations. If you are using the traditional based kernel estimate, um, you basically would get these sort of large rings around the outside, whereas this is the true movement of the animal, predicted movement. What this method does is it sort of looks at those two points and it builds up its, its smoothing parameter and its, its utilization distribution along the line. So it, it, it much more is focused around the movement rather than just a spot, a spot, and, and go around the outside of it, which makes it much better for moving through corridors um, of, of, of utilization, or in this case, not just corridors, but also barriers as well. And um, it has an option where you can actually incorporate the barrier into the estimate itself. So for instance, around Dyer Island, with a traditional estimate, you're going to lose Giza Rock and you're going to have a lot of spots, or, or, or sorry, areas that, that just simply wouldn't naturally be used by the animal. Whereas this, it's taken in Giza Rock and Dyer Island, and it's calculated its utilization distribution around the, um, the environment. So it was very much a necessity for this study that I had to change that method. Um, the other methods that, that Ryan used, um, I kept the same. Linearity of tracks and rate of movement of tracks, and I also looked at the distance from the seal colony, Giza Rock as to where these movements were taking place. Now there was a few limitations with the study site which I didn't necessarily think about when I first came in. Obviously in Mossel Bay we've got a lot of protection and we can get those what, 106, 109 hours is your record? Seven. 107 hours. So, so obviously that's a fantastic amount of effort that goes into getting that. But we tend to get bigger waves in hands by it and um, the site is a bit further out to sea. Um, there's pinnacles that break and the sharks just love to go around those pinnacles. We've got a lovely harbour um, that, that, that is, is very easy to get in and out of at all times of day and night. Um, yeah, but basically all of these, and the whales as well, which love to come up to your boat and do things. It's difficult. Um, so, so already effort was a big limitating factor on this study. Um, we also, we have fantastic weather and went to tag a shark and one of us cut themselves and then we did tag a shark and um, somebody might have dislocated their shoulder um, and that put an end to that track. So there were some problems with this study but what we got, um, what we got was some, some good results from it. Um, so I use a pole spear um, to, to tag, uh, we use pole spear to tag our sharks. Um, it works relatively well. I mean, there's obviously the alternative of using a, a spear gun, but this is just the method that, uh, that, that we used in Mossel Bay before, so we used it again. Works. Um, the first shark that we tagged at Dyer Island was a very large male shark. 
Uh, he was satellite tagged in 2004 at Dyer Island. Uh, he is missing a large chunk of his tail, so he's actually very, very easy to spot. And he comes to Dyer Island every year, certainly since I've been there. He's been there every year and he's, he's often seen around Shark Alley. And, and we got lucky that we went out one morning to go and tag a shark and we talked about how we would love to get this guy. He showed up. Um, and for the first day's effort, he was very much, very much in this very small area of, of Shark Alley. He didn't leave. Uh, he went backwards and forwards, almost moving in sort of triangle motions or circle movements around, go up close to the rocks and then go a bit further away. And just repeat that movement over and over again for many hours. And then as stuff came, um, when night time came, he, he moved out and we just lost him. There was big waves coming through here. We lost the shark and that was the end of that tracking session. But the next day we came back out again, the day shift found the shark that was Michelle and Ali um, in Shark Alley again, doing very much the same sort of thing in a slightly different area of Shark Alley, backwards and forwards, very close to the rocks. Um, I don't believe a seal was caught on this track, but on, uh, certainly on other tracks when they've been moving very close to the rocks, they've caught seals in this area. There are a lot of seals in the area, which, which Michelle will go into uh, in the next talk. Uh, and this continued throughout the day, and then when we made the changeover of shifts, just as the sun was coming down, something changed, and at night time the shark moved away uh, and patrolled in a, in a distant reef um, before coming back the next day, and you can't even tell the difference between day two and day three because the overlap is 90-something, 98, 99%. It's, it's basically the day's activity area is exactly the same, and it continued throughout the whole of that day. Then the weather got bad and we couldn't continue the tracking the next night. Uh, but when we have linked several days and nights, um, we, we, we've got the same sort of pattern emerging, very much in the daytime in Shark Alley, uh, and in the nighttime doing other things. Most of the days weren't strong moonlight, but we did have this one occasion where we had fairly, 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 fairly large moon, fairly, fairly new. Um, and in this occasion, the shark patrolled on the offshore end of, of uh, Giza Rock, um, which, which Michelle will talk about seals later, so I don't want to talk about seals too much in this presentation, but, but, but it's in one of those areas that is important for seals. Um, as soon as the moon set, the shark took off and he made this sort of roundabout migration. We thought he was leaving the bay, but he just turned around, he came back, and as the sun came up, six o'clock on the dot, he entered Shark Alley and spent the rest of the day in Shark Alley. So already this idea that I had coming in that we were going to get dawn and dusk hunting and foraging around the seal colony and during the day at night time we'd get the resting as had been seen in Mossel Bay before um, wasn't happening um, so we've got some very clear differences um, occurring um, we did tag and track more sharks we weren't injured for the whole time um, so we got five which is which is a bit of a limitation in sort of numbers but it's still a pretty good data set each one of these points is um, is a position over five or ten minutes. Um, and the exact number is, is in the 200 to 300 hours, I think, to somewhere around there. Um, the amount of hours we've got around Dyer Island and like. So quite a decent data set um, for, for sort of analysis. Uh, maybe not a lot of individuals. But they were all, except for the first one, which was a female tag, in short, they were all males. Um, they were all around three meters is the smallest to, to 4.5 and, and he would have probably been 4.5 if he had his whole tail for the, the other shark. So they're, they're, they're all sort of getting onto that size of the sharks that are supposed to specialize on seals. So they're all fairly larger and they are all male, um, which allowed the comparisons between the tracks to be, be a bit more, more non-biased. Obviously females will have to get the females later. Um, so, so when I looked at the comparison between the, the sort of linearity and rate of movement, the, 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 the parameters that Ryan had used in his previous study, um, visually it was there, but this is just to sort of um, emphasize it a bit more. Day to night, um, you've got a lot, lot straighter tracks. Basically, a, a higher value of linearity is, is, is more in a straight line. A lower value of linearity is the backwards and forwards motion. So when they're making these movements very close to the, the, the seal colony in Shark Alley or sometimes just outside and there's another spot next to some kelp, they're moving very, very much backwards and forwards. They're not making straight migrations. They're really utilizing that area there, not the whole area around Dyer Island or Giza Rock. Uh, and the rate of movements when they're doing this is lower than those nighttime movements where they do seem to take off and go and do something else. So there's, there's, there's 
differences here, and, and those differences are the kind of things that Ryan was, uh, or, or sorry, Ryan and Enrico saw uh, more during the day and dusk. Uh, so dawn and dusk, the day and night. We've got kind of similar patterns, but it's not at the same time of day that, that, that you guys were seeing. Um, and if you look at it overall in the distance from the island as well, and you compare it to Mossel Bay, you can, you can kind of see those spikes there that they had, and we've got more troughs during the day, and, and it goes, all goes up a bit during the night. So what we're seeing is that things are a bit different in this study site to Mossel Bay. Um, and I have got general linear models um, for it, but, but as I said, I've been on holiday, so I haven't put them all in yet. Um, but you can see the visual, tra the visual traits, and we've got most of those backed up with statistics as well. Um, as far as size goes, uh, we had these, um, these differences with different sized animals in Mossel Bay. Um, and, and I looked for that as well. Obviously, the sample size is, is small. But we didn't have great differences between the, the sort of adult ones and the sub-adult ones um, in terms of the rate of movement and linearity. The one significant thing we did find is that the larger the shark, the closer its, its habitat use took to Giza rock, particularly during daylight hours. Um, so there is a relationship between size and, and, and how close they're foraging to the silt. Um, with the, the, the movement-based kernel density estimate, um, we were able to successfully use it um, around this heterogeneous structure. Um, and, and you can see very much the large males, you see the red spots, that's about the 50% isobar. Um, you can define the isobars better, but basically it is the red. So it, it just looks better like this. Um, and you can see the, large, the, the two very large sharks were very close to the, the same sort of areas. And, uh, and there's another reef up in the, in, in the area called the Heldstein up here. Uh, which Michelle will get into a bit later. That was a smaller shark, that was the female. She utilized that area, but these big males, um, they were right on the edge of the seals. Um, and the third spot, which is, which is here, we call the drop zone. Um, no relation with size, but obviously it's a, it's, a, it's a very small sample number. I mean, we can maybe explore that later uh, when we've got more. Um, so, so basically the conclusions were for this study that it was very different. Um, particularly to Mossel Bay, but also if you look at what Allison found in False Bay, uh, again, it's very much dawn that the animals are coming up to, to Silt Island and utilizing that area. Um, I, I don't know, uh, at, well, in South Africa, uh, a, a study that's found that the sharks are using um, a seal colony as a resource throughout the whole day. Um, so it does seem that the environment's playing a major role, um, but I'll leave those conclusions to, to Michelle in the next talk to go into those. Um, just a bit about home range studies. Obviously the big limitation is that you can't follow the shark away with acoustic data. But now we can because uh, we've got this fantastic data set. Um, you can already see areas of, of high aggregation and, and, and areas of lower aggregation. But these movement based kernel density estimates could be very useful to use to actually uh, find out the distribution of Southern African uh, white sharks and actually get a real home range study um, that perhaps highlights sort of core areas of habitat use uh, and maybe core areas of threat as well. Um, and, and with overlaying of that, you can, you can look at sort of management decisions from there. Um, and there are gaps. Um, obviously, there's some gaps. This is Cindy's track. But for the most part, um, the movement analysis would be able to work. Um, the guy who wrote the program is someone who I'm in communication with a lot, and he thinks that these tracks will work with the movement base. Um, what we might have to do is break up seg segments <coughs> here and there, and then piece them back together at the end. But it is a very viable choice, the movement based kernel density estimate. Um, it, it would work on these tracks. I think I played around with a, with a few with the old one. You, you can make home range analysis with this, just a few, a few short tracks around Dyer Island. Uh, well, not Dyer Island, but that area. Um, but obviously there is a very real need for this kind of study to be done. Um, as Alison was saying, there's about 20 odd papers that could come out of the OSEARCH project. Um, this is one that I'm very interested in being a part of and, 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 and doing, basically. Um, and then we can look at just, just how we can maybe follow on from, from what you were saying the other day about 
policy change, um, education, and so on. We have to highlight the threat to, to this species. Society is protected, but it's legal to, to eat it in Mozambique, right? So, yeah. Uh, thank you guys very much. Um, and thank you to my team as well. Um, Alison and Michelle are here too. Alison's coming up. Tammy's always a great help too. Um, <laughs> thank you guys very much. Thank you.